Um, so I want to introduce uh, our speaker for tonight. Really pleased to have Nari Lee, and who's a professor of intellectual property at Hankin, uh, which she joined in 2012. She studied law at UR Women's University in Korea and Kyushu University in Japan, and holds a PhD from the University of Eastern Finland and a Doctor of Laws from Kyushu University. Uh, since 1996, she has researched and taught in the area of intellectual property and international trade in universities in Europe, Asia, and the USA. And her research experience includes post, the post of affiliated research fellow at the Max Planck um, in, uh, in 2012 to 2014, researcher at the visit, research visitor at the University of Cambridge in 2016, Senior Global House of Fellow at New York University Law School in 2017. Uh, 2019, in the spring, she served as a designated professor at the Center for uh, Asian Legal Exchange at Nagoya University in Japan. And very much to her liking, in 2019, she was a research visitor at the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Law at the University of Cambridge. Um, so, Nari is going to talk to us today on cross-border misappropriation of trade secrets. So over to you, Nari. Okay, so thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to join this uh, webinar series. I'm extremely pleased. Um, uh, also because of the fact that I really, really, really miss uh, visiting Cambridge. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm sitting here in snowy Finland, it's really cold outside, and I keep on thinking about how beautiful fin uh, Cambridge was uh, during spring, and how lovely the people at the Sipple were. So, so I miss it very much, so I, it, uh, this was a welcome invitation for me to talk about um, I'll talk to people I love and, and, and talk about a topic that I feel quite uh, passionate about in a way because while I was, uh, which is a cross-border misappropriation of trade secret, uh, while I was preparing this um, uh, talk, I realized that I've been thinking about and I, I've been sitting on this uh, topic since 2017. Uh, when uh, I come across um, a, uh, this topic uh, when I was visiting the United States and at the invitation of Professor Sharon Sandin, I visited her law school and gave a talk on uh, EU trade secret directive. And at the request of the organization uh, organizer at the time, uh, Professor Sandin asked me to talk about enforcement related issue. So without actually uh, uh, doing so much study on this topic, I actually uh, you know, listed all these you know, applicable law and jurisdiction questions related with enforcement of trade secret in Europe. And that seems to be quite confusing. And what I can say, and you will hear uh, from uh, my talk today, that that situation didn't change that much still <laughs> since 2017. Uh, and also my knowledge uh, of the subject made me even more confused about this topic. But regardless, uh, this talk is uh, loosely based on a, uh, two papers. Two papers I drafted. One of them are two book chapters I drafted. One of them has already been published. Um, um, in uh, a book edited by Nicholas Brun and Grand Dumody and uh, Marianne Levin and Anska Orli that came out uh, this year, um, um, a book entitled A Transition and Coherence in Intellectual Property Law. And there, there's a one chapter that I wrote and open, uh, which is entitled Open Yet Secret Trading of Tangible Goods and Trade Secret. And um, uh, another uh, book chapter I wrote on a um, related topic, um, uh, which will be published is Hedging into Property, Invisible Trade Secret and International Trade in Goods. I, hopefully, I, hope, I hope that this will be published quite soon. Both of these book chapters address the issue, uh, the starting point of the question, whether trade secret is a intellectual property or even property. So that uh, I uh, asked this question, um, uh, because of the fact that that has been a theoretical debate, what is the nature of trade secret or what is the nature of trade secret protection? Is that intellectual property right or is that um, uh, property right? And these two uh, book chapters deals with this, this issue and in uh, my open yet secret and trading of the tangible goods and trade secret in that book chapter, I argue that trade secret directive, um, uh, uh, European Union's trade secret directive um, um, in particular, Article 4, um, uh, Paragraph 5, um, 
liability um, um, uh, introduces a property-like element in the trade secret protection, which is problematic in a way because trade secret, the original trade secret, has always been considered unfair competition. And, and trade secret as a discipline of law uh, do not have that much doctrine that deals with the object-based um, uh, uh, object um, uh, misappropriation or infringement for that matter. And similarly, uh, in uh, the other book chapter, Hedging into Property, I approach this question uh, from a, a constitutional law point of view, whether it is a trade secret is a property in the sense that that is a property interest that is safeguarded by constitutional law as a fundamental right. And I, I uh, go through different uh, layer of European Union's um, law on this matter. And while I was working on that chapter, uh, the decision um, from UK High Court on Selgard, um, uh, Sinovitz, uh, Selgard v. Senior came out, which deals with the question related with the, the infringing goods, uh, uh, goods um, uh, question. So toward the end of that book chapter, I actually had some text written on, four pages or so written on uh, this topic that I'm uh, presenting today. But it is my hope that based on today's talk, uh, I will uh, produce a uh, a standalone paper on this particular topic and cross-border infringement, um, uh, cross-border misappropriation. I called it infringement, which is uh, wrong because I uh, pointedly do not want to use the word infringement in this, uh, in this context, cross-border misappropriation of uh, trade secret. So that is a starting point of uh, this paper. So uh, why do I actually think about uh, how, uh, what, do, uh, what is the research question that uh, this project uh, is asking is how do we think about uh, trade secret uh, cross-border misappropriation? In other words, how to conceptualize this? Um, the reason why I'm asking this question is that in other, uh, in intellectual property matters, in intellect cross-border intellectual property infringement matters, we often have this issue of foreign uh, domestic rights that gets infringed in uh, conduct infringement action in foreign countries leading to domestic dispute or foreign right uh, gets infringed in domestic uh, conduct and uh, uh, giving rise to dispute in, in, the, in domestic court or even in uh, some situations foreign uh, rights uh, which is infringed by conduct in foreign countries and somehow through a connecting point end up in a uh, domestic court. Um, um, the question uh, that, uh, that uh, tra trade secrets cause for the misappropriation, uh, by the way, misappropriation, I, uh, I, it's not just mis of, of acqui uh, unlawful acquisition, but it's, I use this uh, misappropriation broadly cover all uh, misuse of trade secrets, um, uh, including all acquisition disclosure and, um, and uh, use of trade secret. Um, in trade secret uh, uh, mis misappropriation cases, um, uh, it, because of the nature that uh, there is no correlating domestic trade secret right and foreign trade secret right, but rather it is tied to a conduct uh, of uh, conduct that is regulated as unfair uh, conduct that is harmful um, for honest commercial practices. Uh, it gives rise to the question whether there's such thing actually do exist <laughs> in a way. So the, the question that I'm actually asking is, be, um, uh, can trade secret be localized in like the way IPR does, that domestic right, foreign right, and can be conceptualized then cross-border uh, misappropriation as cross-border misappropriation, or do they actually cross borders, cross, uh, do a cross-border uh, misappropriation actually cross-border? That is the research question that I would like to um, answer in, uh, in this uh, project. As you can hear, this is on uh, work in progress. This is not ready um, um, uh, yet, although some part of it is uh, written. So any comments and questions you, uh, you could give at the end of the presentation would be very useful. So the background of this, as I had said, is European Union's trade secret directives, uh, um, um, uh, Article 4, 
uh, which provides uh, four types of misappropriation. Um, a misappropriation in Article 4 of Trade Secret Directive, which is a minimum um, harmonization directive. Uh, uh, that means that member states may provide uh, more extensive, extensive protection of uh, trade secret, provides four kind of four, four types of uh, trade secret uh, uh, misappropriation. Um, uh, in paragraph two, um, um, unlawful acquisition by primary actor, and uh, paragraph three, um, using disclosure uh, after unlawful acquisition or in breach of contract or other duty not to disclose, and paragraph four, by third party unlawful acquisition use of disclosure, and paragraph five, uh, which I call knowing trading of infringing goods. I have uh, in the next slide, as you can see, I have a fancy graph. <laughs> so the graph, uh, graphically, these uh, uh, clause can be explained in this manner, that uh, primary actors, um, actors' uh, behavior, so primary actors' acquisition, uh, whether it is unauthorized or commercially dishonest, is provided in paragraph two, and primary actor, or uh, actor who uh, unlawfully acquire or uh, uh, user disclose um, uh, and use it or user disclose um, 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 a trade secret information against duty or duty of confidence or other kind of duty that is provided in paragraph three of article four. And, and the difference is between a primary act, what I consider a primary actor's conduct um, uh, to paragraph four and five is paragraph uh, these primary actors' conduct have contract or uh, other duties that's connecting them to trade secret holders. So there's a possibility of contract or there are possibility of agreements or there are possibility of directly connecting them to trade secret holder. holder. Uh, whereas third party uh, liabilities, I, uh, I, uh, third party liability that is provided in paragraph four mm -hmm. and trading of uh, infringing goods, the liability which is provided in paragraph five uh, is connected to the trade secret holder through the knowledge, uh, through the knowledge of unlawful, um, um, unlawfulness unlawful uh, use or and so on and so forth. So through the knowledge they are connected, not through contract. So there cannot be, um, there is a, a uh, 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 there is a contract that relates with uh, contract or other uh, duty that is imposed on the primary actor, but uh, the secondary actor, so-called third party liability is uh, 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 outside the boundary of that contract. And uh, it is here, uh, uh, paragraph five liability falls. And, and uh, uh, to illustrate, I, I can show you the paragraph five uh, of trade secret directive. Di uh, directive. Here it's, um, um, you can see from here that production, offering, and placing on the market of infringing goods or the importation, export, or storage of infringing goods to, for those purposes should also be considered an unlawful use of trade secret where the person carrying out such activities knew or ought under the circumstances to have known that trade secret was used unlawfully within the meaning of paragraph three. So it, it ties uh, traders of infringing goods and it, uh, this uh, uh, provision uh, give rise to a, 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 um, a liability or impose liability on the traders of infringing goods. I, uh, um, those who are producing offering and, and so on and so forth um, uh, on the condition that they know or should have known that that the trade secret was used unlawfully. So there is an underlying unlawfulness uh, of paragraph three. And uh, this uh, 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 infringing goods in uh, trade secret directive, uh, as has been pointed out by many uh, authors, um, um, that it is uh, uh, problematic because it is uh, defined quite broadly in Article 2.4. It uh, includes goods design characteristics, functioning production process of marketing, of which significantly benefits from trade secret unlawfully acquired or used or disclosed. That means that whole bunch of goods uh, uh, not only directly embody the trade secret, but goods that may actually benefit. So so-called mixed goods or even partially uh, uh, partially um, connected goods um, uh, that uh, that uh, 
as long as it is uh, um, uh, significantly benefiting uh, to uh, from the unlawfully acquired um, uh, used or disclosed trace, uh, trace it could, could be covered by this liability also. So, uh, and also at the same time, uh, since uh, I'm showing you the paragraph five, we can look, it, look into the wording of this text. It doesn't say anywhere that this person uh, who's uh, um, carrying out these activities are necessarily third party either. So this actually could, in a way that uh, I, I was, when I was looking very hard into this paragraph that I was wondering whether is this actually a third party liability or even primary act of liability because it doesn't say it from the text alone that this has to be a third party. So anybody, it could be anybody who's carrying out such activities uh, who if they knew or, or should have known uh, that what they were doing, uh, what uh, the, the pro, uh, goods that they're trading um, has been um, um, uh, uh, produced using um, uh, trace equipment that has been unlawfully uh, used or uh, disclosed within the meaning of uh, uh, paragraph three. So this creates uh, quite a lot of open, in a way, flexible and, and broad application. And as this being directive, of, co of course, how member states have uh, transposed them into their member states law would uh, be uh, the uh, crucial um, uh, information uh, to find out what is the scope of this liability. But also uh, in and of themselves, this text doesn't actually uh, uh, provide us with much information about when should we know, uh, when does this person act carrying out such activity should know. And uh, most importantly for uh, uh, today's discussion, that where actually should it be unlawful? Um, uh, is it uh, because by, especially in highlighted in red, uh, if you look at importation and exportation is covered by this, uh, this uh, paragraph five liability, but importation and exportation are, con which are such conduct that always imply two different Different places, at least at least two different places. So, uh, does uh, this uh, clause in and of itself uh, include a uh, clue about applicable law, um, or does it actually say that uh, applicable law should be uh, somehow decided by reading carefully, reading and interpreting this uh, paragraph? But uh, that is not. Uh, if you look at uh, the recital, that is not uh, necessarily uh, uh, the case. But first, what is the purpose of this uh, um, this uh, paragraph five liability? The trade secret uh, directive uh, recital four and twenty eight clearly uh, uh, shows that this uh, liability or trade secret directive uh, in general um, uh, is very well aware of cross border. Um, misappropriation and cross-border uh, uh, cross activity using trade secret. And uh, recital four uh, shows that it targets cross-border activity. And recital 28 um, shows that considering global, or, uh, uh, recital 28 uh, provides that considering the global nature of trade, it is necessary that such measures include the prohibition of importation of those goods into the union or the storage for the purpose of offering and placing them on the market. So paragraph five uh, liability targets those goods that are originating from outside European Union entering into European Union and prohibit such uh, uh, importation based on paragraph five. Uh, five, uh, five. So uh, this cross-border um, 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 activity should be covered by this liability. This uh, raised a um, uh, important question then how do we decide, um, um, uh, um, how, it is, how do we decide and what should be then applicable law in understanding um, um, and finding of the liability based on paragraph five? Because as I said, because it's cross-border uh, conduct is implied imported and exportation, at least two uh, uh, territoriality or two jurisdiction uh, is implied in this. And unfortunately, trade secret directive alone uh, doesn't help us to uh, settle this question because the directive do not aim to establish any harmonized rules for judicial cooperation's jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of judgment in civil commercial matters, uh, namely the jurisdiction of rules or deal with applicable law. So this question, trade secret directive is not meant to uh, uh, harmonize this thing. So we should not read from uh, paragraph five, that's uh, we should not read uh, from paragraph five and um, any 
um, applicable uh, law or any uh, uh, rules related with uh, uh, jurisdiction and other union instruments such as Brussels regulations and Roman uh, Rome uh, regulations one and two then sh uh, should be uh, uh, used in terms of understanding uh, which countries um, and uh, which countries law uh, should be applied and where uh, should we need to, um, uh, what should be the applicable law. So, so this opens up uh, questions are related with both jurisdiction and um, um, applicable law. Um, um, so th that makes it crucial in a way in jurisdiction and, and, and in cross-border juris uh, cross uh, dispute, um, in choosing uh, or in understanding uh, jurisdiction uh, rules and applicable law uh, rules, characterizing the underlying dispute or characterizing disputes and cause of action uh, is crucial. Um, I'm sorry, I'm doing something with my mouse that go, goes back and forth all the time. Um, but a characterization of trade secret dispute becomes um, crucial um, because in, in conflict of law rules, I'm sorry, uh, is it me who's doing this? <laughs> or is it someone else doing this? Okay, so conflict of, of law rules, uh, um, uh, decide uh, this thing, and it is crucial to characterize the underlying dispute, uh, trace, uh, trace secret dispute, correctly to apply uh, uh, correct uh, rules uh, concerning uh, jurisdiction as well as applicable uh, law. But trace secret, as uh, uh, as uh, it has been uh, written by many. Um, many uh, scholars, as well as uh, you can see from case law, uh, includes all different uh, types of disputes and uh, there are complex layers of issues that um, may, uh, they might imply any of this. Is it, is it uh, uh, to start with, is it even a, a dispute uh, related with uh, trade secret? Is it a public dispute, public uh, or dispute re uh, uh, related public law, or is it a dispute related private law? Because sometimes trade secret relates with a state act of uh, compelling uh, certain parties to disclose certain information. Is it criminal and civil law? Because civil law, um, um, uh, most uh, many countries have criminal liability on uh, trade secret uh, misappropriation, misuse, um, and a trade secret directive, of course, deals with only uh, civil law liability um, due to the competence of European Union being uh, covering only civil uh, civil liability. But if civil, is it a contract or non contractual issue? Because as you have seen in my graphic uh, representation of. Uh, trade secret misappropriation. There could be private, uh, primary actors whose, uh, um, uh, uh, whose conduct is um, uh, duty bound by con through contract and uh, duty of confidence, or there could be non contextual issues uh, as in the uh, case of third party, or uh, paragraph one, paragraph five type of situation. And uh, most importantly, uh, as I said in the beginning of uh, this presentation, there's a question of whether trade secret is, is property or unfair competition, or neither for that matter. Um, and there are, of, uh, because of the fact that uh, trade secret dispute relates very often, uh, former employee, there are labor law issues uh, that are involved. And is that, an, um, uh, is that rule uh, concerning uh, employment is the uh, primary um, uh, cause of action or should it, uh, should it be something else? And of course, uh, last but not the uh, least, there are issues related with the personal um, informations and uh, privacy issues that might be involved here. So uh, what I'm trying to say, the characterization of dispute is crucial in figuring out which law to apply in cross-border dispute. But on the other hand, uh, trade secret uh, disputes are uh, wrought with many different clues as to which uh, uh, types of uh, law should be applicable. And uh, trade secret disputes, uh, uh, whether a, a trade secret directive uh, in and of itself does not help because uh, it uh, doesn't say uh, either. Um, in recital 16, uh, trade secret uh, directive uh, states that that doesn't create, uh, the directive should not create any exclusive right to know how an information protected as trade secret. That doesn't mean, so that means that it, it is not an IP, but that doesn't mean that it is not an IP always because member state may still um, um, impl transposed or may still protect uh, trade secret uh, law as a species of IP predating trade secret um, uh, directive also. Um, so, uh, so it will again depends on EU members. 
we are now talking about not only the outside uh, European Union, we are talking about within European Union, there could be differences also on the characterization of uh, what is the nature of trade secret. It may also, the prevailing view is trade secret uh, disputes and trade secrets are unfair competition regulation. And indeed, that is the point that I was making in one of the book chapters that I uh, introduced to you in the beginning of uh, this talk. And uh, I argue that actually um, uh, trade secrets shouldn't be considered intellectual property and, and, and Court of Justice of the European Union in interpreting um, any disputes, um, uh, any, any part of this trade secret. Uh, directives and disputes related with uh, trade secret uh, directive, the interpretation should be not uh, uh, away from my people to work on fair competition. But uh, then again, trade secret directive in and of itself uh, says in a, in a limited fashion that it does not aim to reform or harmonize the law on uh, unfair competition um, in relations to um, uh, slavish imitation. So, um, uh, but on the other hand, trade secrets um, are often regulated as unfair in the unfair competition law of the member states. So that uh, confuses matter even further. And uh, so there's no clarity in characterizations that can be, uh, uh, that can be seen from the directive itself. So that, that leads to a even uh, more uh, uncertainty uh, when we are uh, uh, applying or looking for correct uh, um, uh, uh, rules to apply uh, when it comes to uh, issues related with uh, jurisdiction, Brussels regulation, uh, which provides for special jurisdictions for matters of contract, tort, criminal proceeding, close connection um, um, when it came in the case of multiple de uh, dependent employed or myself and uh, exclusive jurisdictions for IP. Any of this can be implied uh, in uh, trade secret uh, disputes and um, uh, cross-border trade secret disputes. And, and, um, and uh, similarly, such confusion continues when we are actually trying to figure out what should be the applicable law. And applicable law, the very first question um, uh, would be raised that should which of the piece of the uh, EU regulation that we need to apply because Rome 1, uh, which applies to contractual obligations, Rome 2, non-contractual obligations, which often have been um, prevailing view have been that we apply Rome 2 to uh, uh, dispute related with uh, uh, business secrets, but uh, 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 Anska Oli has pointed out to me that Court of Justice of the European Union uh, case that broke Citra case that broadly defined what is a contractual um, obligation might actually um, uh, show different um, uh, direction. So th this, uh, the first very question is which source uh, should be our uh, source to uh, decide uh, on the applicable law question that is, uh, uh, again, that is the first question that one might need to ask also. And in, uh, even if you take the prevailing view of Rome 2, Rome 2, Rome 2 has uh, three relevant parts. Um, uh, uh, it uh, gives up even, uh, uh, even brings, about, brings about even more uncertainty because there are three different possibility um, uh, to be uh, 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 to use as a basis to decide on applicable law, law, Article Four, which is general rule, and Article Six, which applies specifically or is, um, uh, to unfair competition, and Article Eight, uh, which applies to intellectual property law, and 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 which and unfair competition law in Article Six. Uh, Two, one and two, and six one actually uh, provides a rule, so so-called uh, so market-oriented rule. And but uh, paragraph two of Article six of uh, related with unfair competition uh, refer back to Article four again, not the place of um, uh, where the damage occurs. So uh, 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 that uh, uh, that so that again, I would like to highlight um, the fact that even uh, using this. Um, 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 uh, rule, uh, we still have many um, uh, places and many applications, uh, many um, uh, places that we can base, uh, um, tie this uh, applicable law decision on. So there are many uncertainties uh, there as well. And this is an illustration example. So uh, I will skip. Uh, so these are uh, 
basically the main point I want to say is that there are um, uh, uh, various rules under the room. And all of this could be, I guess, uh, because I want to get to the cases, because I advertised this talk, <laughs> that I'm going to talk about the cases. And, uh, and it becomes more concretized when we actually look at the case, the city of the Selgard decision um, um, uh, uh, from UK High Court. And I will compare that to four decisions. I uh, advertised it with uh, uh, three decisions, but I added uh, two, uh, two more decisions uh, to this uh, list because just because it is interesting <laughs> interesting and um, using using their patterns uh, fact patterns and I will apply that uh, this uh, uh, apply this to uh, paragraph five liability so-called trading of the infringement liability uh, in this uh, cases uh, these are uh, these cases all deals with this cross-border mis uh, profession in this very complex uh, graphic representation. Um, uh, the key point is that there are uh, different, uh, I just added a party name and, uh, and um, but in these cases uh, that there are uh, parties uh, who's asserting uh, trade secret and acquisition and disclosing use at the prim primary actor who are all uh, former employers, um, uh, former employees, former employees, their location was one and um, where disclosure and use and manufacturing using this um, um, uh, uh, misappropriated allegedly misappropriating information uh, was used, trade secret information was used well, on another um, uh, territory and it was imported into uh, the country of dispute. A, a more detailed um, table <laughs> is, is, this, uh, 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 is this. What I wanted to highlight um, is that in Selga, which is the case that uh, I want to examine a little bit more in detail here, because it deals with uh, UK, uh, a high court decision, and deals directly with paragraph five uh, liability um, um, of EU trade secret directive is uh, related to a uh, um, trade secret that was asserted by Selgard, which was a US company, US company. Um, um, and uh, it was aiming to stop a importation of a product that was manufactured in China into UK. So there were three different um, um, uh, places in, in, indicated, US uh, trade secret holders uh, uh, location of the seat, uh, location of the seat or where the, uh, where the trade secret was uh, legitimately controlled and importation into UK and manufacturing um, by uh, in China, in China here. And uh, uh, the litigation uh, or the uh, dispute uh, happened in UK court uh, and it was uh, related with interim injunction. So there are different factors to consider that, uh, that allow the judge not to address certain issues uh, that is uh, important in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, paragraph five liability. But the court applied UK law, uh, which implemented um, EU trade secret directive. This was before Brexit uh, uh, trade secret directive. Um, and um, uh, based on the fact of import importation alone. And all the other cases that, uh, that is shown on the right hand side in, in blue, uh, it deals with uh, US cases. And uh, uh, um, in, all of this deals with, oh, I'm sorry, again, this had happened, uh, deals with uh, uh, cases where uh, previous employees, uh, former employees, um, uh, conduct was, in, in, uh, conduct was uh, implied, or conduct was the basis of um, uh, trade secret misappropriation uh, at the litigation. Uh, but it also it in, indicated, a, uh, it um, um, uh, related with the uh, cases where, um, um, uh, in case of LG Electronics, so you know, let me start from this end. So a Tian Rui case, because this is the landmark decision that uh, expanded the scope of ITC uh, 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 juris uh, jurisdiction. It was a case of so-called US trade secret uh, because of the fact that um, the information was le legitimately controlled and asserted in United States um, um, uh, was uh, taken uh, and manufactured uh, in uh, and used uh, in manufacturing in China and uh, uh, sent back to United States through um, uh, importation. In Sino Legend case, it was Chinese um, uh, uh, trade secret or Chinese party, uh, Chinese Hong Kong party, a Chinese party and Chinese, um, Chinese um, uh, manufacturing facility. 
um, uh, litigating against each other in, a, you know, in United States uh, through importation into the United States um, in, um, uh, uh, in this, uh, in Daewoon, um, um, I think this was Daewoon, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Daewoon case. In this uh, case, uh, or, or in Meditox case, Medi sorry, Meditox case is a uh, two Korean companies, uh, two Korean companies, um, uh, Korean trade secret, uh, Korean trade secret, because uh, uh, a company that is claimed asserting the trade secret Meditox was mainly um, uh, research and developing in, in doing the research and developing the trade secret knowledge in Korea. Uh, and uh, it uh, allegedly misappropriated trade secret, uh, or not alleged anymore because it has been um, um, uh, finalized at ITC that uh, in, uh, in uh, misappropriated this information and manufactured uh, the product and imported uh, the product to the United States. In the most recent case, um, uh, it's slightly different where, because manufacturing, um, um, manufact so it was a Korean company against Korean company in United States ITC court, but manufacturing um, uh, was meant to be done in United States as well as Hungary. So there were a uh, Hungarian manufacturer also was uh, uh, involved in this uh, decision as well. What I would like to highlight is that the place of importation was UK, US, 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 and uh, the law the court applied, and uh, which was uh, in case of UK, applied the UK law um, uh, uh, using the rule that it is a place of damage and ap ap applying the applicable law uh, of the place, uh, law of the place of damage, and um, um, uh, based on um, in interpretation of trade secret directive and Rome Convention, um, a, a paragraph uh, Article uh, Six, which uh, uh, refer back to Article Four, and applied um, applied uh, UK um, uh, which UK law, which was a transposition of EU law, and uh, and um, of course US law doesn't do this exercise of. Uh, in, is exercise and it's just based it's uh it's uh tariff tariff fact that empowers ITC to stop um uh, importation of these goods and engaged in um, um analysis of whether uh this uh, uh trade secret information was uh, unlawfully um acquired um uh, acquired uh, uh, and uh, reviewed the unlawfulness of primary actors uh conduct yeah UK court didn't do that um uh, didn't do that uh, because and because uh, uh, the problem of um, uh, paragraph uh, five is um, there's two type of conducts are in, in, implied that not only importation is um, prohibited, but because it requires uh, uh, that the person who's engaging in that conduct to have known that trade secret was used unlawfully uh, within the meaning of paragraph three. So paragraph three conduct is also implied in paragraph five liability. And in import export cases, that um, uh, if uh, uh, a country of exportation um, uh, is the place where the uh, trade secret was used, then uh, almost always that this uh, 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 paragraph five liability would be applied to um, uh, extraterritorial conduct, um, uh, that a use of trade secret outside, um, outside the country of importation in the country of exportation. So this leads to a question that in judging uh, or in understanding paragraph five and applicable law for paragraph five liability of uh, uh, trade secret directive uh, article uh, four, that do we always need to uh, uh, divide this and apply two different set of law to uh, importation and uh, another set of law to uh, uh, to the knowledge of unlawfulness, um, to the unlawfulness. And this mosaic approach is uh, very much disliked by conflict of law uh, scholars and private international uh, scholars and applying um, uh, two different law um, uh, to this. Um, uh, 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 one liability is uh, undesire undesirable, but if, uh, if you don't do that, then almost always then you have to uh, apply um, um, EU law, in this case, European Union law or national law, national law transposing EU law, 
uh, to this conduct as well, to country of exportation, uh, to the conduct uh, of use in the country of exportation as well. Um, as well, that is, uh, uh, as in the cases of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, ITC cases, and that is the, the argument um, that I that I uh, make in this uh, project, and uh, that argument, um, um, uh, the or I guess glimpse of this argument can be seen in uh, cell guard decision, where uh, the court ruled on the basis of information uh, importation alone. Um, um, uh, applied so, uh, importation alone and, uh, and characterizing it as unfair competition and applying Article 6 of Paragraph 2 of uh, Rome Convention um, and applying uh, UK law, UK law. But because the nature of this dispute uh, was so that it's seeking the interim um, uh, relief, interim injunctions to stop the importation, because importation hasn't, hasn't happened yet. And uh, the judge uh, sort of, the court sort of avoided uh, 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 ruling on this knowledge of unlawfulness uh, requirement. Um, uh, requirement. And, uh, and, but he posits uh, the judge uh, in, uh, uh, in the opinion, he posited that maybe it is Chinese law that has to be applied to, uh, in this case, that when we are discussing that whether there is an unlawful um, um, use of trade secret, but he doesn't, uh, he uh, uh, writes in paragraph six. Unfortunately, it's not necessary at this stage of proceeding to reach a conclusion as to this correct answer or to this thing. So he avoids uh, answering this question. Um, that leads to a, uh, my concluding uh, remark on the, uh, on the whole talk. So in trade secret, as uh, I try to illustrate to you uh, with this talk, that this localization of domestic forum may be a, uh, maybe not be possible because uh, we are not talking about uh, foreign right and right because of the very fact that it regulates an unfair conduct and prohibits certain uh, behavior, um, um, uh, behavior that uh, you may actually even be able to think that if importation, the conduct of importation into a particular country is what is prohibited, and if that is a standalone cause of action for trade secret misappropriation, uh, trade secret so-called cross-border misappropriation cases in trade secret may not even actually um, uh, cross-border trade secret cases, but rather um, only the nationalities of the parties or the uh, the uh, importer exporter has, happens to be located, but the conduct itself actually uh, is dealt, uh, is territorially dealt with. So that way, uh, by understanding it this way, would avoid the question of uh, uh, troublesome extraterritorial application of uh, EU law, which uh, uh, Professor Dreyfus and uh, um, uh, Professor Silverman has written um, in 2017, would make uh, EU law to rule the global, uh, rule the world, and global uh, global law by applying uh, things uh, extra ter territorially, but. Uh, because of the fact that to find Article 5 liability, Article 4, Paragraph 5 liability, you still need to decide on, you still need this uh, requirement of unlawfulness and knowledge of unlawfulness is required. So if you frame it as a standalone cause of action uh, to avoid extraterritoriality, but it would necessarily mean that if you're not talking about applicable law and cross-border uh, or extraterritorial application of law, but substantially you, uh, you might be requiring um, 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 uh, the court to make a presumption of um, unlawfulness even. Um, I, I, said, I, I think that this is um, uh, not really a uh, 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 full baked idea yet, but uh, that seems to be uh, the case. Uh, case otherwise, uh, it, uh, it would always be ending up with extraterritorial application of EU law. And this is uh, quite problematic, and the problematic uh, nature is uh, more visible when we compare that to uh, patent uh, law. This is uh, Article 26 that is would be comparable, I think, to uh, this type of uh, infringing goods liability uh, or trading of infringing goods liability by third, uh, third party. Um, uh, and this is a um, uh, Article 26 of Unified Patent Court Agreement which may be <laughs> going into effect next year by some people who are uh, projecting. And there, and this is a similar kind of uh, 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 statutes you can uh, find in uh, UK uh, Patent Act, as well as um, um, 
as Finnish patent tech even, and uh, where uh, similar liability is provided um, uh, but on the third party, but their unlawfulness requirement is um, uh, requirement is not uh, uh, part of the uh, this liability, and therefore uh, uh, this uh, consideration uh, do not necessarily. Um, uh, uh, related with this extraterritorial ter territorial application or not, uh, uh, or not, uh, do not arise in um, um, patent cases also. And, and there also I added here that uh, there are, of course, other limitations that is related to this clause. Although this is broad, but uh, at, at the same time, uh, it, uh, this unlawfulness requires a requirement uh, doesn't exist as part of this thing. So therefore uh, less troublesome. So now this is my final, because that was my conclusive uh, remark in a way that there seems to be a cross-border misappropriation is not really crossing borders when we're looking at the importation as a uh, domestic conduct alone. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I can actually add another conclusive remark on this uh, shame. Uh, it's, uh, it's such a shame on Brexit because this case, uh, Selgard, uh, the senior decision, could have been a very interesting case if it was raised uh, and um, pre uh, it, would have uh, gone to Court of Justice of European Union to uh, see whether uh, whether this is actually the case that uh, Lord Justice uh, Arnold uh, in paragraph 67 of the decision that this is a very difficult question and one which may very well have to be answered for the member states of European Union by the Court of Justice of the European Union in due course. Um, it's a shame because of the fact that you know uh, Britain is not part of uh, EU anymore so therefore such a for all um, cannot be made uh, uh, based on this case. And, and I'm sure that he would have made that uh, uh, <laughs> reference, uh, reference, and we would have seen a very interesting uh, court of justice uh, decision on this uh, very concept, which is um, uh, an autonomous, co autonomous concept in uh, European Union law that has to be uh, understood that way. All right, I think that was the uh, last slide uh, that I've shown. Um, and I think I thank uh, everybody who's been listening to this, uh, uh, and uh, I will. I would like to receive any questions and comments. Thank you very much.